Australian investing icon Ian McComb tells you what makes a good investor and why he thinks diversification is dead. Well, investing is more difficult than ever. And at its most basic, it is fear and greed. Some of the groups that were good investors many years ago sort of lost their way. So 60-40 is the way things always were. And there's always, you know, tremendous inertia in any industry, but it's, it's not good enough in the world that we live in now. It's Monday the 12th of February, and you're watching Markets with Madison. Billions of dollars is flowing to investment management firm Pinnacle. It now has 100 billion Aussie dollars worth of client funds across its 15 different investment businesses. There's no surprise why. 80% of those businesses are beating their benchmarks. In the past decade, the firm has made a total compound annual growth rate of 22%. The man behind it all is Ian McCoon. In this interview, he tells me how all good investors think including why they only aim for alpha. Ian, hello. Thank you so much for your time today. Hi, Madison. Thanks for having me. You're most welcome. Thanks for being here. Pinnacle is a consistent outperformer, even though all your affiliates are in different asset classes, whether that be private credit, Aussie equities, emerging markets, going long on global markets, private infrastructure, private equity, and even venture capital. But what is the same across all of these strategies that makes them work? So we have a particular business model that was designed, um, you know, 20 years ago, uh, specifically to create an environment where investment excellence can prevail. So what's common amongst them all, we always look for people who are the most talented in their asset class and their space. So that's what our model is about. It's about people more than specific investment styles. So we cover a very range, a wide range of asset classes and styles, but what is common is these are people who are the real deal. They're the best of their kind. And there's a particular environment, generally called a boutique environment, in which the most talented investment professionals really prosper and they, they blossom and they deliver the best possible investment outcomes for their asset class. So what are the attributes then that make someone an excellent investor? Is it a mindset? Is it conviction? Yeah. So there are certain personality traits that are fairly common. They tend to be very focused, very passionate, uh, quite narrow individuals. There's lots of things don't interest them, but their, their whole life and their whole world revolves around delivering investment outcomes for their, for their clients. They can be difficult to work with sometimes, <laughs> and people um, always joke about my life uh, working with these. Prima donna is not uh, an appropriate term, but they're certainly they're very intelligent, very focused, very high-quality individuals but boy, they get angry if anything looks like it's getting in the way of good investing. You know what I think? They actually sound like pretty great people, if I'm honest. <laughs> they are. To be honest, I'm in awe of them. I was never smart enough to be one of them. So, you know, I figured out this career of supporting them and working with them. And uh, I, can sort of, I can sort of do well on their shoulders. If you look at the investing world beyond Pinnacle, is there a type of big time investor or strategy that you really look up to? Um, there, there've been a lot of um, individuals who are just freaks. That, you know, they are just able to, to gain insights and uh, to figure out angles that just produce better investment returns. And, you know, we, we could name um, many of them. Uh, I've always been a keen student of them because, as I say, I've been in awe of such people because the need for good investing is enormous. Um, you know, we, we say that our mission in Pinnacle is enabling better lives through investment excellence. So we have to always remind ourselves 
that there are many millions of people out there whose lives are improved through good investing. And you need these talented people to produce good investment outcomes. And you also need to go deep on certain asset classes, right, and be pretty active and seeing what isn't and isn't doing well. So out of all of the asset classes that Pinnacle is involved in, which one or few excite you most and why? Yeah, so they all have their time in the sun and in different conditions, different asset classes sort of blossom. Um, we, we have added a number of different kinds of asset classes in the last few years, and that's proved to be very successful. So we've, we've added private equity, a group called 5B, private equity and venture capital. They're operating in New Zealand, by the way. Um, we've added credit, so private credit, uh, a group called Metrics, um, also is established in New Zealand and uh, are doing very well there. This credit is particularly exciting because it, uh, in many respects, it replaces traditional bonds and it's a way of, you know, it's defensive investing. It's not, it doesn't have the volatility of equities markets and yet we are producing returns quite substantially higher than, you know, bank deposits and that sort of thing. So it's, it's really exciting and that is growing. That's growing tremendously. They've gone from well, they started up with us and they've gone to $16 billion already and they're just going to keep growing. What? Huge that. Sorry, what was that huge, even? Uh, huge demand for private credit. There's also Coolabar, which is, which, which is listed credit. That's also pretty exciting and they're going globally now and uh, they'll compete in the hedge fund market in the US. Coolabar is exciting as well. I did do an episode late last year with Chris Joy from Coolabar, one of your affiliates, and they're getting massive inflows, so good on them. So you know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about particular kinds of individuals. <laughs> He's a very passionate, very passionate individual. Let's call them high conviction, should we? Is that a safe thing to say? Never in doubt about things. So then it kind of still shocks me, Ian, that there is still this big push from the funds management industry for the 60-40 portfolio. Is it dead? So 60-40 is the way things always were. And there's always, you know, tremendous inertia in any industry for things to stay the same. So 60% um, equities, 40% bonds, nicely diversified. Um, but it's it's not good enough in the world that we live in now. So I believe it is dead. I mean, equities and fixed interest or bonds will always be important components of the portfolio, but they are nowhere near good enough on their own. You need a lot more. You need, um, I mean, diversification is the key to sustaining higher returns with less volatility. Um, Capital markets are a lot more sophisticated these days. You need a lot more arrows in your quiver uh, for investing. So these sorts of extra things that we're talking about, a lot of private markets, asset classes, private equity, private credit, uh, water and agriculture. There's a whole range of private markets, asset classes. They are now very important components of any portfolio. Why do you think that there is still that inertia in the funds management industry? Is it excessive conservatism? Is it lack of knowledge? Maybe even just sheer laziness? Yeah, so any industry is established in a certain way and, you know, there are strong vested interests in things staying as they were. I think that's an important part of it. I think advisors and investors generally are used to operating in a certain way. Um, it takes time. Sometimes it takes disruption to really shape people out of what they're habitually used to. Uh, but it's coming. Uh, investing is changing a lot. Investing is more difficult than ever, really. And you need, you need this extra sophistication, these newer asset classes added into portfolios. And it's exciting because you can have quite superior portfolios to the traditional ones. 
What is that opportunity that you at Pinnacle see beyond traditional diversification? Yeah, so still a role, as I said, for global equities, local equities, um, fixed income, et cetera. But quite a substantial portion should also be in private credit, private equity, venture, um, listed credit, that sort of thing. These are very diversifying. Each of the asset classes in their own right produces strong returns with less volatility than the traditional, traditional asset classes. So, the, you know, we're in an environment now where inflation is more of a threat. There are a lot of things to worry about out there. So to have a strong, resilient portfolio, you need this extra diversification in it. What do you make of the growth of exchange-traded funds, this global boom in ETFs that we've seen over the past few years? You say that investing is harder than ever, but ETFs are supposed to make investing easier. Or do they actually make beating the market harder from an alpha perspective because everyone's in on beta through ETFs? Yeah, so this is the global trend. Um, ETFs are very convenient for investors. It's just like buying a stock on the exchange. So, I mean, we at Pinnacle, we're agnostic as to what kind of vehicles people use. Whatever works for them, we're happy to supply. But I think you're particularly talking about passive ETFs. So, um, you know, passive investing has grown a lot. And, um, you know, there's an important role for passive because it tends to be cheap and convenient. So, um, but it's horses for courses. That suits some people. Um, we're active investors. We think you can do better than passive. And, um, you know, over time, we think if you're, if you're working with the, with the most talented people, um, they can do better than passive. So people's overall returns can be higher. But look, it's a great, there's an important role for passive and, and um, it's a good challenge to the active industry, the fact that passive is out there. Yeah, I do want to talk to you more about that point on accessibility and convenience for investors. Because all of those things that you've told me you're excited about, whether it be private credit or anything else that Pinnacle is involved in, like private equity, venture capital, what's mostly available to everyday retail investors these days and not those asset classes that excite you and big investors most. So what needs to change in the accessibility of these new, often outperforming asset classes to allow people to get in? Absolutely. You're right, Madison. Those asset classes have generally not been available to individual investors. It's been the big funds, the very big uh, super funds, the big institutions who have been able to access, you know, private equity, private credit and so on. Um, we are working hard to bring those asset classes to individual investors. So we've been setting up a lot of vehicles that are accessible to the wholesale and the retail market. And I'm sure you've talked to David Batty, he's doing that. Um, we, we are really excited about that because we think good investments, good asset classes are the right of everyone. And just because you're not a really big investor doesn't mean you should be denied access to these. We have to work with the regulators. They have to be satisfied about liquidity and so on. Um, but we are supplying the wholesale and retail markets with exactly the same investments that we're supplying to, you know, the future fund, uh, Middle East and sovereign wealth funds and the biggest investors in the world. And that's, that's really exciting. There's lots of other trends out there in market other than that sort of active versus passive and accessibility issue. Trends like ESG, responsible investing, do they last, do you think? Oh, absolutely. We think responsible investing and ESG are a permanent feature of the investment environment going for, uh, forward. And there are so many areas where we have initiatives uh, along those lines. We, we have never subscribed to the fact that you have to accept lower returns to invest in things that are good for the environment and good for society. We think the two go hand in hand. We actually think it's risky to invest ignoring the environment, social and governance things. So, yeah, we're big on ESG. 
There are a few areas in the US which are kind of quite right wing that have opposed ESG investing, but generally speaking, the whole world has embraced it and we think that's a good thing. Ian, I've heard you say in another interview that you think investors typically overstate what they worry about, whether that be geopolitical events, economic situations. What is a concern that's popular right now that you think is overblown? And what's one that you think perhaps is undercooked, one that we're not worried about enough? Okay, absolutely. So yes, I've said that um, ever since I can remember, and I've been doing this for 40 years, there have always been a range of really worrying events out there, things that investors are terrified of. And that's normal. That's just the world. But my observation is that people focus too much on that. They become too nervous and worried. It makes them very conservative as investors and they miss out on a lot of the growth that happens. So my point is that... Um, a lot of these things, they just they don't eventuate or they don't have the sort of economic and financial impact that people think. So right now, as always, you, you can be very worried about, you know, the situation in Russia, the Ukraine, China, the West, um, all of the elections that are coming. Um, I think it's 80% of the world's population is, is voting. Uh, for, for a chunk for, for their government in the next little while, and people worry about the Trumps and and so on. So geopolitical is very big. Um, generally speaking, these events either don't end up as bad as we worry they might, or they don't have the impact that you think. So um, the the one that has dominated in the last few years has been monetary policy. You know, inflation is real. Central banks are increasing interest rates. That was a real concern and did have an impact. That has moderated now, and I think we're towards the end of those concerns. So I'm quite optimistic about markets. Over 40 years, you must have some pretty incredible stories to share. Can you share anything about something that you thought was going to be a big risk in markets and didn't end up being so? Or perhaps vice versa, something that you thought would play out on markets but never actually did? Yeah. So even fairly recently, the pandemic, the pandemic was something that we had, we'd never seen in our lifetimes. It was huge. It was scary. It was a human tragedy. A lot of people died. Um, so about, um, well, it was March 2020 when the world looked terribly gloomy and uh Equity markets dropped 30%. And we all thought, oh, my goodness, what lies ahead? You know, we're looking at a really, really dire situation. I know our share price went down to $3. As I said, markets tanked 30%. And investors sat there terrified, absolutely terrified, abandoned equities on an enormous scale. What happened in the end? Six months later, markets started to rally and they rallied right back to where they were and investors missed out on a tremendous um, tremendous returns. So that was so what was wrong there. We weren't wrong to be worried about what might lie ahead. But what happened in fact was that, you know, we had monetary stimulation, fiscal stimulation to contemplate, to, to compensate for that. And that was extremely positive. And then lo and behold, we found vaccines and we found ways of getting through this terrible situation. And it didn't work out to be anywhere near as bad as we had thought. So a lot of investors being too conservative just missed out on, you know, the most enormous games in, in decades. So that was a great, a great shame. One of the things I remember when we started QIC, so I was the first chief executive at QIC many years ago. We had a big think about the world and what might lie ahead. And we wanted to figure out which blocks, which uh, economic blocks would be the most successful. So there was the US, there was Japan, and there was Europe. And I remember reading a US academic wrote a book that said basically the US would be a basket case, Japan would win this global race, 
and Europe would be somewhere in the middle. And I remember saying at the time, oh, I don't know about this. I know the US has a lot of problems and, you know, um, wages are a lot higher, their industrial base, the outlook is gloomy. But I just think don't ever write off Americans. They are so innovate and so on. And, of course, what came after that? Microsoft and Amazon and so on, and it's been enormous. And uh, and right now, the Magnificent Seven, they're called the seven biggest stocks in the US. If you haven't been in them in recent years, you've missed out on them. But they're enormously valued. So what do we do about them now? It's one of the great dilemmas. But um, it just goes to show um, you might think you know what lies ahead, but very often works out differently from what you expect. So be careful. That's why diversification is so important. I think Warren Buffett would say in those situations, Ian, be greedy when others are fearful and vice versa. Absolutely. And that is tremendous investment wisdom, but it's easier said than done. The vast majority of people do the opposite. And at its most basic, it is fear and greed. These are powerful human emotions. And I, we talked about fear, the fact that fear stops people from going in um, when it's going to be the best time because that's when things look the most bleak, usually ends up being the best time to go in. So if only you could have been brave enough to go into equity markets when in March 2020 you'd have made a fortune. And then greed, um, so many any investors come in after markets have moved up a long way, uh, which is the most dangerous, actually, but it feels the most comfortable. Do you think there is more greed than fear in markets right now? Um, no, no, right now there's still too much fear. There is still quite a lot of fear out there. So equity investors um, have, have, are hiding, uh, are still worried. Now, I think that will turn once people realise that um, monetary tightening is basically finished. Now, obviously, we don't know. There's lots of speculation. But, no, investors are still too worried about interest rates going up and not coming down. They ought to be more optimistic than they are at the moment, in my opinion. I want to lastly talk to you about the funds management industry as a whole. And I know that they do differ ever so slightly across the Tasman. But I think what you're seeing in Australia, as much as we are in New Zealand, is crazy consolidation. Firms, at least here, are folding into each other. Last year it happened all the time. That effectively means that competition and options for investors seeking active management are shrinking, right? What do you think is driving this crazy amount of consolidation and where does it end? Yeah, so one of the factors is that some of the groups that were good investors many years ago sort of lost their way, uh, became too comfortable. I mean, we could spend an hour on the reasons that good investors um, lose their, their talent and what made them great. And it's happened on an enormous scale in the US as well, by the way. And those groups are being consolidated because they're just not good enough anymore. Someone will take them and improve them. That's, that's what we hope will happen. It's also a desire for lower costs um, to keep fees low. Um, scale is seen as a way of lowering costs. Uh, we have a different view. We believe that quality and excellence are everything, not scale. So, um, I mean, we like to have scale in uh, the support services of distribution and infrastructure. But in investing, we love the boutique environment where talented people uh, have their own business and are focused on their own investors. So we don't like this consolidation thing, but we see it happening. It's, uh, it's going to happen more and more in Australia for a period of time. Our super industry is also consolidating, building scale to get lower cost. Um, but we're about excellence. We, we think it pre producing good returns is more important than cost per se. So when I ask where does it end, if lower fees is the result, what's the result on return 
Does that weaken too? Ah, now that's a $64 question. And we mustn't allow that to happen. Um, if all we get is lower fees with mediocre investment returns, that's a bad outcome. We have to stay focused on good investing, excellent returns, and that's difficult. And not a lot of groups can do that. So um, who knows? The jury's out. We have our own biased view, which is that if you stay very focused on having the right environment for the most talented investors, you'll get the best returns. And high returns are more important than low cost. How many firms have been coming to you and asking Pinnacle to buy them? A lot. Um, so look, this, this might sound a little... Um, so arrogant or immodest, I don't mean to be. We are actually a very humble group because we know how hard good investing is. But certainly we've seen um, a lot of investors understanding that, you know, um, regulation, um, the need to have very high quality back office and support and distribution and so on means that they... Um, our model has become very popular. So we have a lot of investment groups who'd like to become part of Pinnacle. We can't accommodate them all. In fact, we generally say we only end up partnering with maybe one out of 20 of the groups that we consider seriously. So we have to be very selective. Our standards are very high. We only want to work with people who are truly awesome. You know, you have to be really awesome to come into the pinnacle stable. What's, what's that barrier to entry? What's the percentage points above benchmark or standard market returns that you will only open the door to? Well, look, it's quite subjective. Um, it's hard to quantify. But we know when we spend some time with investment professionals, pretty soon we know, are they the real deal, we say to ourselves? are these truly talented investors that we have conviction they're going to produce good returns for many, many years into the future. The difference oh, it varies by asset class, but it's quite large, the excess return that you get from excellence. But we think if you can't be excellent as an investor, don't bother, go and do something else. I'm going to ask you one very last question on investing excellence. How much do you think excellence in the investing space will be replaced by artificial intelligence? So artificial intelligence is going to be a very positive, very helpful force for good investing. I mean, I think of investing, it's always been the same. It's about gathering information, analysing it and gaining insight so that you can make superior investments. Now, back in the day, you see I'm getting old, I've been around for a long time. Back in the day, investment professionals spent a lot of time gathering information. You know, it was time consuming. Um, the, the advent of technology has been tremendous. It's meant it's, it's much faster and more effective gathering information. There's a lot more data available. Analyzing it is much easier. There's very powerful computing. Gaining insight is still difficult, and this is where you need humans. But it means that people can get better and better at investing, better insights. That makes it more competitive. Ultimately, that's good for investors. So I'm a big fan of AI. Like all new technology, it can be harmful, it can be good. Let's use it for good, but let's really use it. All of our uh, affiliates are using AI in various ways, and it's early days. They're going to do a lot more of it. So, hey, bring it on. I, I love AI. And I love your wisdom. Thank you so much for sharing some of it with us, Ian. It has been amazing to chat to you. And hopefully when I'm over in Aussie, I'll swing by and say hello. You'd be very welcome. I'd love to, love to see you over here. That has got to be one of the most fun and honest conversations that I've ever had about investing. Absolutely loved it. Let me know if you want more interviews with investing icons like Ian. I'm thinking Bill Ackman next. Now go put your money to work.
Thanks for watching Markets with Madison, the New Zealand Herald show for interested investors. If you want to stay up to date with financial markets, click the subscribe button below and you can watch our other episodes here. Stay up to date with all the business news and numbers as they land on nzherald.co.nz.